as director of the John Paul II Institute for Marriage and Family, the Melbourne Session, it is my honour to introduce this series on the theology of the body. But what is the theology of the body? It can be misunderstood, it can be simplified, or it can be approached in depth, and that's what we're doing here in this series. Theology of the body is a gift to the church of St. John Paul II, and not just to the church, but to the whole world, which explains the widening interest in this understanding of the person as embodied. The great difference, male and female, the complementarity, self-gift, self-donation, it's much more than sexuality, however, which is why it will be explored in depth by the experts in our faculty. And they bring with them not only knowledge of the theology of the body, but experience in teaching it. For it's taught in all the institutes across the world in the family of the John Paul Institute. The Mother Institute is in Rome. And so I commend this to you. Approach it with an open mind. Be willing to draw on its riches and be willing to be changed in many ways, by the wisdom of the saintly Pope, who certainly changed our church and our times. audio-visual series in which different lecturers and educational staff from the John Paul II Institute of Marriage and Family in Melbourne will offer a reflective and we hope a thought-provoking guided tour through one of the most important teaching contributions of St John Paul II's long and epoch-making pontificate. The body of work we'll travel through is immense and in some places quite daunting. The text of the series of the catechetical texts is popularly called the Theology of the Body. Although John Paul II's original title for the work is Man and Woman, He Created Them. And at other times it's been called Human Love in the Divine Plan. The Theology of the Body provides a profound and challenging theological vision, not only for Christians, but for all people who wonder about the meaning of being human of being man or, and woman, or who long for love and fulfilment. Now, the aims of this series. Well, firstly, to offer a systematic but not exhaustive guide through the text of the catechesis itself. Secondly, to assist the audience to understand the scriptural, theological and philosophical connections and allusions and the context of the text. One of the third aims of the series is to enable viewers to gain an insight into the importance of the Pope's theology of the body for the development of preaching, theological anthropology, and so on. That is a vision of what it means to be human from God's perspective, including sacramental theology and moral theology and other pastoral applications. The fourth aim is very practical. It's to encourage an appreciation of the theology of the body, which will guide and enrich the vocation and the mission of our audience members. So what is the theology of the body? John Paul II's theology of the body was brought to light in 129 weekly talks during the Wednesday papal public audiences delivered at St Peter's Square, most usually, and consisted of short, but dense catechetical bites. These audiences were delivered in the early years of John Paul II's papacy from 1979 to 1984. 
The theology of the body can be defined as a re-narrated and freshly integrated theological exploration of the key texts of the scriptures and the words and the actions of Jesus Christ. This theology proposes that God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit reveal themselves through the created gift of our bodies and through our sexual identities, that we are man and woman and also our desires. It shows how God's creative, redeeming and sanctifying love relates to our being in body persons. It proposes God's own image is touched and revealed in our deep desires to find, know and participate in true love and in our aspiration to give and receive ourselves in and through our bodies. The theologian Livio Molina also says that Pope John Paul II composed this cycle of teachings to reintegrate Christian wisdom and, as he says, to make up for certain deficiencies in a tradition of thought which has not been able to adequately evaluate the human body or to make sense of the richness of biblical data. So in other words, to, to reintegrate our tradition and the philosophical ideas. John Paul II saw evidence for this deficiency himself, not only in the, some of the strands of modern culture, but in even some of the aspects of the Catholic Church's preaching and its pastoral life. And a vision of the body which saw holiness as a flight from bodily existence. The writing of this series began before John Paul II became Pope in 1978, partly to provide a more thoroughgoing response to the widespread misunderstanding and hostility which had greeted Pope Paul VI's teaching on marriage and fertility in the encyclical Humanae Vitae, which was promulgated in 1968. This encyclical among other things, provides a defence of the meaning and the purpose of the sacrament of marriage and the meaning of married sexuality and fertility, both as it relates to couples, to their children and to the common good. So it looks to questions like the relationship between a couple and the state, for instance. John Paul II strongly supported the decisive and prophetic stand which Paul VI had taken, including Pope Paul's reaffirmation of the Church's condemnation of actions and technologies such as abortion and contraception, which threaten unborn human life, but which also threaten the integrity of married sexual life. However, Paul VI believed that a more profoundly convincing, Christ-centred and scripturally sourced foundation needed to be provided to the Church's witness to her people and to the world. It's significant, therefore, that John Paul II structures his catechesis around three major biblical picture frames or panels. You might like to think of an altarpiece and an, or an icon, which is sometimes called a triptych. So there's three panels that belong, fit together as a whole. And these three sections can be roughly divided around these script scriptural sources. The first around Genesis chapters 2 and 3, including and a reference to Genesis 1, so that's the first panel. Second panel uh, based around uh, St Matthew chapter 5 and the Sermon on the Mount, so the second word of Jesus. And the third around Christ's words about the resurrection and the kingdom, found in Matthew 19 and 22, and also uh, re referred to in St Paul's reflections upon the themes, these same themes in 1 Corinthians 7 and 15. To do this, the Pope adds two additional but central scriptural reflections at the end of this series. Those upon the letter to Ephesians, chapter 5, and upon the wedding themes in the Song of Songs and the Book of Tobit. So if you see, they all belong, all these panels belong together. On to this vast biblically referenced form, John Paul II weaves some of the elements of other areas of Catholic tradition. It's mystical, it's moral, and even its artistic dimensions. And also, he adds his own considerable philosophical studies. These are centred around the importance of human experience 
and upon the importance of moral responsibility in action. So if you can imagine this great edifice with this woven through. The result is a gigantic and captivating narrative which touches upon the body's theological implications for procreation, for sexual relationships, for art, bioethics, politics, culture, education, worship and pastoral care. The Pope's original texts were first written and delivered by him in Italian and were translated into different languages and published in the Vatican newspaper La Zovatore Romano in the week following their delivery by the Pope on his Wednesday audiences. So they came out one at a time. The particular edition of the text that we, we, we will be referring to in this series will refer to an English language publication which is the fruit of nine years of scholarly labour, commentary and compilation by Professor Michael Waldstein, or Professor Mikhail Waldstein as he's sometimes known. There are of course other translations available in earlier print forms, the original Lesovatore Romano editions, and even on the internet. This, this translation has the huge advantage of having a consistent and deeply considered choice of translation and an excellent glossary and an introduction. So each of the terms that are used are consistent throughout the whole series. After the, the compilation of Theology of the Body, many commentators, popular evangelists and theologians have contributed to a clear exploration of the Pope's important initiative and have continued to develop the implications of his thought. And that's what this series is doing as well, we hope. Who was the author of all of this? Who was Pope John Paul II? Well, and before we look at the text, I think it's important to learn something about him because he's now declared a saint and is a teacher. His life was touched and influenced by some of the most dramatic moments in the history of the 20th century. He became one of the most recognised and influential figures in that century. He was a mystic, he was a world leader, he was a source of interfaith negotiation, he was a political force, and he was the beloved papa to many young people who reached out to him. He was, sometimes we call it the John Paul II generation uh, of people who really were evangelised by him. He was born as Karol Wojtyła on March the 18th, 1920, in Poland, in the town of Wadowice. His early life was touched by the death of loved ones. His mother died when he was nine years old and he lost a physician brother, Edmund, when he was only 12. He also lost a sister before he was born. His devout father became his only surviving family and on leaving school, he decided to enrol at university and to become involved in acting and theatre. During this time, the Nazis invaded Poland and savagely persecuted Jewish Poles and other dissidents and took control of key institutions in Poland. In 1942, Karol entered the underground seminary program after a period of discernment because he was really enjoying his acting and feeling that this was contributing vastly to the resistance to Nazism and to the, the future of Europe. And he, while he was doing that, he kept up his secret theatre company which explored the lyric and dramatic power of the spoken word. At the end of the war, he was sent to Rome to continue his studies and completed doctoral studies on the mystical theology of the doctor of the church, the Carmelite Saint John of the Cross. As a priest, he developed a keen awareness of the painful but important questions surrounding human love, personal relationships, and the sexuality of men and women. As Father Carroll, he was a teacher and a pastor and a confidant to many thousands of young men and women, either couples or those before they had married, especially on matters of love, marriage and morality, the morality of human relationships. Later, as a theologian bishop at the Second Vatican Council and then as Pope, John Paul concluded that the church was struggling in contemporary culture it was struggling to convey the richness and beauty of her central teachings about the preciousness of human life, 
the integral importance of faith and reason, the dignity of the human body, the importance of sexual ethics, and the vital need for a new catechesis in order that all the church, laity and priest, man and woman, family and institution, could take part in a new evangelization. Okay, the gospel of life and love and a culture built upon it is needed to be proposed in a lively, creative and convincing way to all cultures and to the root questions thrown up by contemporary revolutions in technology, living styles, attitude, thought and behaviour. Let's look at some of the key themes in the theology of the body and particularly in John Paul II's attempt to present what he called an adequate anthropology. Now, as we've explained, one of Pope John Paul II's aims in his theology of the body is to retell and deepen the church's teaching, both doctrinally and pastorally, especially as this relates to the fundamentals of the human person. John Paul II states in several places that theology of the body is about exploring and witnessing to an adequate anthropology. What he means is that the human person needs to be seen in a way that's authentic, truthful, fitting and fully human. So that it can answer the question of who we are and what we're called to be. In choosing this term, John Paul is consciously expanding a phrase used by Pope Paul VI in Humano Vitae the integral vision of man, Humana Vitae number, number seven. John Pope Paul was proposing to present his teaching as an integral vision of man. He notes that we cannot convincingly answer the challenges to marriage and family unless we base it on an adequate anthropology. A fitting picture of the human person is not partial or reductionist. The embodied person cannot be explained by mere biological materialism on one hand, nor can his or her body be used as a mere accessory for his or her will. The anthropology is only true if it takes into reverent account the mystery of each person's existence, our embodiment, our moral freedom, or our response to love. Our bodies play an essential part of God's revelation to the world. The body has been created to transfer into the visible world the mystery hidden from eternity in God and thus to be a sign of it. They're John Paul II's words from Theology of the Body. John Paul II explains that we cannot hope to find a fitting or convincing answer to the questions of human existence without seeing humanity as a whole, man and woman. And to see this reality as part of the distinct revelation of God's divine plan. It is Christ's word, both his person and what he says, that points to our beginnings. And through this answer, we gain insight into the very structures of human identity in the dimensions of the mystery of creation and at the same time in the mystery of redemption. Again, the words from Theology of the Body. The key themes throughout the entire work stem from the words of Christ, the body as the sign or sacrament of the person, the communicative and expressive role of the human body. John Paul calls this the language of the body or the body's propheticism, its ability to, be, to show, to reveal. Our personal and communal ethical sensitivity in our stance, which he calls our ethos and so on. There are many other key terms which our series will explain when we meet them. It's worth noting that there is one theme that underlies the entire theology of the body. And it is an interpretive key and a marker of all John Paul II's reflections on the theology of the body. The main and paradigmic theme is of gift. God's gift of creation our desire to give ourselves, 
the freedom that is needed in order to give a gift and to reciprocate that giving. We need freedom, maturity and self-mastery. Our orientation and fulfilment in self-donation. The gift is the fundamental characteristic of personal existence. Let's say that one more time because it's so important. The gift is the fundamental characteristic of personal existence. One other theme um, that is important and an approach that John Paul II takes in Theology of the Body, which is important for us to think about here, is the role of experience and particularly of what he calls our original experiences. Church is sometimes accused of proposing a, a very idealistic moral vision which has no connection with the complex nitty-gritty of human life. It's detached from human experience, theoretical. Now most people who claim this have not in fact read or nor do they understand the theology of the body. Because if they had read it, they would see that the category of experience is absolutely central to every text in it. According to the theology of the body, the human experience of love is a legitimate means of interpreting the divine love and divine revelation. God's love and human love, human sexual and erotic love are not in contradiction. Experience is patterned so as to reveal God to us especially if that experience is, is seen and interpreted and acted upon fittingly, truthfully. On the other hand, and this is the problem, so much of our human experience is scarred by partiality, by life wounds, by false assumptions, the hurt of others and our own poor judgment. But a careful and grace-receptive re reflection upon our deepest experiences are, John Paul II says, trustworthy. They tell us something important. One of the most evocative ideas that Pope John Paul II introduces in this first part of his unfolding cycle of the theology of the body is the notion of original human experiences. What the Pope means by this is that when God first made humanity, his plan and his loving call was played into our being, into our experience as a type of musical chord. And this chord has three clear and beautiful notes which are particularly clear and felt by Adam and Eve in the Genesis story. These original experiences the Pope calls Firstly, the original solitude. Secondly, original unity. And thirdly, original nakedness. And we'll touch on each of those in our coming series. This musical chord, as I've called it, has been blurred and obscured. I sometimes think of it as the music of Eden. The echo, however, of that music is still alive in the depths of each person's heart. And that's been so throughout all of history. For example, the teenager who feels misunderstood and locks herself in her bedroom relives in a grumpy and flawed but very human way the seeds or the note of Adam's original solitude. Such an experience can be appealed to. And with grace and with cultivation, this experience, I am unique, I am alone, can be a foundational experience for that young woman to see the meaning of God's gift of personal dignity and vocation to her. These experiences that John Paul calls original are firstly primeval. They are included in the Bible story of humanity's origins. Secondly, they're universal. The experiences strike a chord in the deepest feelings and the yearnings of each person. Thirdly, these experiences are revealing. 
They give us insights into the meaning of love and into the, into the meaning of sexuality and of our being bodies. It was Pope John Paul II in his long, lifelong pastoral and spiritual insight, his dramatic creativity and his genius for communication, who realised that secular liberalism was an outgrowth of moral and spiritual legalism and the flesh-denying dualism of some of Western culture, but not a rejection of it. Far from leading disillusioned contemporary people into happy reconciliation and their own personal dignity, sexuality and physicality, the reverse has happened. At the same time, the Pope carefully acknowledged the baleful contributions of a lopsided, joyless and shallow, and therefore quasi-heretical, attitude or belief of Catholics themselves towards the matters of the heart, the erotic, the senses and sexuality. It was the Pope's frankness about human failure and empathy with human desire that so appeals to those born after the dot-com sex, drugs and rock and roll era uh, and those fed on fast food and immediate information and fleeting information. He's connected to the centrality of experience, both inside and out. John Paul's programmatic theology of the body is more than a clever, clever sociological forecasting. It's also much more demanding than any revamped checklist of moral prohibitions. And it's not a glib top 10 list for relationship nirvana. It demands from its audience attention, meditation, and sometimes painful honesty. So welcome to the ride. <laughs> <laughs>